Hi, everyone, and welcome to another uh, live session. Today, I'm joined by David Tatum, and um, uh, David is currently based in Australia. And we, I've, I've come across one of his um, training sessions on compliance risk using bow ties. And I thought, well, wow, that is very interesting because uh, we've been using at the company where I'm the, the chief risk officer, we've been using bow ties for compliance risks as well. And I wanted to kind of, you know, to really just touch base with David and exchange ideas. And uh, I thought, well, instead of doing it kind of, you know, the one-on-one, -on -one, uh, why don't we do it a big uh, broadcast session to um, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. And if anyone's watching us and you have questions, you can uh, ask in the comments. And uh, by the way, if you don't mind, maybe just uh, for us to check the technology, uh, write in where you're watching from. Uh, right now, and uh, uh, we'll kind of we'll pick up the discussion from there. So today, our theme is using bow ties for compliance risks, but I'm sure our theme will kind of evolve as we talk through that. Um, so, David, tell us a little bit about your experience in risk and uh, what do you do at the moment. Yeah, thanks, Alec, and hi, everyone. Um, so a brief synopsis is I've been doing risk management for about 36 years, and I still don't know what I'm doing, and I'm learning something new every single day, uh, and hence uh, the, uh, the the view of joining this discussion, and hopefully I can learn something as well. Um, in terms of the more recent experience, uh, 21 years with Protect, um, we do four things. Uh, my passion is people and culture, training, education. Uh, we build software, and uh, we also do advisory and consulting. Uh, in terms of bow tie analysis, um, you'll be able to tell if you can pick it up that I'm actually from the UK, uh, went to Australia in 1987, and I now call myself an Australian. And bow tie analysis, if you go to Dr. Google, uh, and I think Wikipedia uh, will tell you that it was first uh, really spotted as a technique in the University of Queensland, uh, Australia in 1979. Um, and it was uh, kind of highlighted in a paper. It may have had earlier or origins, but we're not sure. And then the oil and gas industry picked it up, um, particularly Piper Alpha North Sea uh, was used extensively for the incident uh, um, analysis and it really then went across oil and gas pharmaceuticals mining and so on and it was all the kind of physical safety stuff that it got across and uh, when we got involved in our business 21 years ago it's primarily financial services financial services weren't really using it uh, we pushed it pushed it it didn't really take hold up until about 2010 10 to 2012 and now the financial services industry seems to have got hold of it as well and uh, we certainly are seeing a as a very simple tool to communicate and a uh, a good kind of what I call a skeleton to be able to uh, you know put all the other risk management stuff around. It is not rocket science; it's quite simple. But I think that's uh, that's the key to uh, why it works is because it is so simple. So I am a bow tie fan. I like bow ties, and I've even got a shirt with a bow tie on. I think it is. It may be this side. I think it is. I'm not sure which one it is, but I've got my bow tie on my shirt just for especially for Alex tonight. So Alex, over to you. Th thanks, David. Um, and thank you, everyone who's watching us. We have people from UK, South Africa, Pakistan, Ukraine, India, Germany, um, lots of people from Australia, uh, obviously. Uh, so well, welcome, everyone. Uh, we, can, we can see your comments, so you can ask questions at any stage. Um, so, so, David, uh, bow ties uh, I mean, have been around for ages. Engineering have used it you know, in oil and gas. Um, predominantly kind of in the more safety context. Mm. How, how did you make the kind of the jump into compliance risks? Uh, um? Yeah, so, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. So safety was where it was all at. And obviously workhouse safety still uses it extensively. Um, and we picked it up, you know, probably 20 years ago as a concept in that space. And then I thought to myself, you know, one of the single principles we I use is risk is risk is risk. And if your risk is risk is risk, so surely the nuances are different. But in summary, they're made up of the same parts, a cause, events, impacts, controls, and so on. So we started playing around with them other than safety and applied it to you know cyber technology, HR risk, fraud, and it worked pretty well. And uh, as a result of that, we then thought about compliance. Now, in compliance, one of the things we found is when you ask someone what is a compliance risk, a lot of people say it's the risk of non-compliance. Uh, 
No, I actually don't buy into that. And the reason is, is because non-compliance to us is an impact. And the reason it's an impact is that the key, one of the key objectives of most organizations is to comply with relevant external regulatory obligations. So to us, given it's a, an objective of an organization, the impact on it is an impact or consequence of risk. So we then said, if it's more of an impact, moving backwards why 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 and you get back to you know the thing that actually started to go wrong that led to a compliance breach so for example a privacy breach if we feed it back it's going to be loss of control over confidential data and that then feeds through to a compliance breach now by doing that we had to try and do I say, uh, try and get the message across that compliance risk isn't the risk of non-compliance, otherwise your risk register is simply full of non-compliance with A, B, C, D, E, F legislation. But if you actually took it back to the point at which things started to go wrong, you ended up realizing that every compliance risk is basically also an operational risk. It's just that the consequence pathway passes through a breach that turns it into a compliance one. So as a result, we said, well, why separate compliance risk from other risks? Surely it's one and the same, and hence the use of the bow tie. So for us, put simply, a compliance risk is one where the right-hand pathway away from the knot, the center, the main event, top event leads to a compliance breach and we found it worked really well it got our message across and we thought well if it works well why not keep on using it so that's what we do that's interesting we had a very we had a slightly different journey to the same conclusion um and our journey and by the way thank you thank you for everyone who keeps commenting and hi daniel um good to see you and um we 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 kind of started with the risk event, you know, non-compliance and a breach of something. And then we quite quickly realized that a non-compliance with a law um, is not a singular consequence because the legislation usually, at least this was the case in, uh, in Russia, the legislation actually explicitly states a number of potential consequences. So it would say, you have to pay the fine, then it would say, uh, and the fine is calculatable uh, based on the formula. And then it would say, you also have to pay for the damages to the environment for the kind of re, you know, revegetation. And that had a different formula for calculating. So that was also calculatable, but it was a separate amount. And then the legislation would say, but also the regulators can stop production for up to 90 days. And uh, the final consequence, and you, there, there are actually quite a few different consequences that the legislation stipulates, uh, but the last one was, and also there is a criminal prosecution. Uh, the management may be prosecuted and may go to jail up to you know, X years. Um, so, so for us, what was interesting, and by the way, the bow tie wasn't kind of the immediate first choice uh, because we started with a decision tree or a kind of a factor tree uh, the, the conclusion was that any compliance risk has a number of potential consequences. And uh, as we kind of started just mapping this out, our objective was originally to quantify compliance risk. So we, we started from a slightly different kind of goal to how do we quantify compliance risk. And um, what, what we quite quickly realized is that any given compliance risk has a number of, like a range of possible consequences, almost like a tree branches. And we thought, well, what technique is scientific, um, has been you know, proven to work in empirical research and can be used to map out different consequence scenarios. And a decision tree was one uh, choice. That was our kind of first choice. And we actually quantified half of our compliance risks using decision trees. But then we realized that, um, well, first, each of the branches has different probabilities. So for example, you know, getting a fine for um, contamination or some other breach uh, uh, of legislation is quite likely compared to, for example, getting a criminal prosecution. I mean, that's, that's much, much less likely to happen. Or uh, a production stop uh, up to 90 days, that's also significantly less likely than getting a fine because we, we, lo and we looked at uh, all sorts of court data, 
um, annual reports and statistics by the regulators, published by the regulators. So through that, we were able to see that some consequences are more uh, historically likely to happen than other consequence types. Uh, and then our thinking kind of evolved into saying, well, a number of different factors, uh, because the legislation also gives you all of this additional information that if you have uh, pre-approved limits, then you're less likely to be uh, prosecuted. If you have uh, special facilities, and you know, I'm kind of I'm, I'm I'm talking about compliance, environmental risks at the same time, uh, because the methodology again turned out to be exactly the same. So we we realized that a number of factors also affect the uh, scenarios, the consequent scenarios. So we really wanted something kind of we, we already had the the the, the knot and the right side with all those branches of consequences coming out. And it was quite a, it was probably more complex than you would expect from a bow tie because some consequences kind of you know, branched out into second and third level consequences and there were, there were you know, quite complex relationships there. Uh, but then we, we were missing the kind of the left side and that was useful as well. But as soon as we started mapping out the left side with all those factors that need to be considered in the risk analysis, that started immediately looking like a bow tie, and we thought, well, well bow tie is a scientific, uh, empirically tested and proven technique as well. So why don't we stop using decision trees and we'll start using bow ties? So that's how we got uh, how we got to bow ties. Um, what what else uh, did you uh, did you find useful in uh, using bow ties for compliance? Because my kind of my the big the big big uh, selling point for me was is that any compliance risk has a number of consequences and you have to map out all those different consequence scenarios because sometimes they're independent, sometimes they're independent. For example, you can get prosecuted and production stopped and fined uh, simultaneously. And bow tie was just kind of a nice way to visually represent it and to talk about it with the compliance internal audit and, and environmental teams. Um, what, what else was useful in your experience, David? Look, look I think um, probably two or three things. One is, you know, picking up your comment on the right-hand side of the bow tie for consequences. So, you know, you talked about three levels and, you know, we often think of three levels. So the first level going from the not to the right is the compliance breach. And often if we're doing, a, a, you know, risk analysis in a, say, a business unit, they will often just simply say, our objective is to comply with X, Y, Z. So the impact is a breach. However, as you say, typically a lot of people pick up fines, regulatory action, uh, reputation damage as their kind of main three. But there could be more than that, loss of license. The management time to remediate is, is enormous. So you then start going to the next level, level two, I would call it after the breach. And this is the impact on the entity itself. But what we try and do is actually go one stage further. And this wakes up compliance people from being people that think they tick boxes to actually being an incredibly valuable resource. And that is pushing the bow tie into society, which is why do we have compliance requirements over uh, the environment? We do it to save the planet. We have anti-money laundering um, requirements to stop terrorists killing innocent children. And if you take it ultimate, the bow tie can almost demonstrate there is an ultimate reason we're doing this, not just to keep the regulator happy. So that's been really good at waking compliance or dare I say even non-compliance people up to actually compliance is an incredibly important function, not just to keep the regulator happy, but to save lives. On the other side of the bow tie, obviously the root cause side. What was really good about this is we found quite a lot of people that were obviously managing compliance were quite reactive and they would often almost wait for the compliance breach to happen and then be breach managers. When in fact, the whole point prevention is better than cure. So if you actually took the time to why, 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 go back to the root causes, they were finding the root causes of compliance risk stretch back for things like inadequate processes, lack of investment in you know good systems, uh, poor recruitment, uh, you know, uh, 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 lack of resources because they're so busy doing something else. And all these factors kind of move the eye from the, the right hand side of the bow tie being reactive firefighting more to the left hand side, which is fundamentally, you know, prevention. Now, the last point is 
the left hand side of a bow tie we generally talk about as being the likelihood driver because the center of the bow tie hasn't yet happened now in in compliance it's interesting is the more you do on the left hand side prevention rather than cure also helps the cure because if a regulator comes in after you've breached and actually sees that you've got a lot of preventative and early detective controls around your compliance risk management and they see it and the breach is kind of a one-off it's not systemic you're likely to get a lot lower consequence on the right hand side as well so it really was a, a, a the value add was really completing the picture from end to end waking a lot of people up that they never ever got back to the root cause so it therefore wasn't being managed and also extending the right hand side of the bow tie to say it's much more than about ticking a box and it therefore got much better buy-in from non-compliance people that compliance was actually a legitimate high value uh, exercise when done properly yeah yeah to totally agree um the one kind of the one big selling point for uh, for us and our compliance team was um making the jump from the visual presentation into some sort of uh, quantitative numbers that you can actually use for decision making um, because some of the some of the questions, uh, some of the hypotheses that we needed to prove using the bow tie uh, analysis was well, how you know, given given that the the, the risk exists, um, you know, first how much does the risk cost, and uh, second, well, how much money should the company be spending to mitigate uh, that risk, and then the third is well, how do different mitigation strategies compare? in terms of the risk reduction. Now, all of those uh, things have historically, and if we were to look in uh, ISO, I, I can't remember the number of the standard on compliance risk management, 31,000 and something, and uh, the COSO guide on compliance risk management, I mean, both of them are basically suggesting, you know, give it some arbitrary numbers, one to five, on the, on the, put it on the map, and then have discussions around you know we if we implement this uh, particular mitigation strategy that the compliance risk would reduce from five to three um i, I don't know about you <laughs> uh, but it doesn't it doesn't work anymore in, in russia at least and in, in some of the european countries because that's not how executives make decisions and if you have for example a water purification plant which you know costs 50 to 100 million dollars um, you probably won't be able to make that kind of investment decision based on the you know five to three uh, risk reduction. So we, we needed something we needed something a little bit more sophisticated than that. Um, not, not only that, we also needed to be able to incorporate um, risk exposure into the actual investment decision uh, decision models. So for example, one of our situations was, Shall we start building um, the, the water purification plant now or in six months? And the risk profiles between those two decisions were completely different. And we needed to account for the compliance, environmental compliance risks to, to properly compare those two scenarios because it wasn't, it wasn't just one is less risky than the other. So they, it was, they had different risk profiles completely. And that's, um, that's not very easy to compare to make decisions when you're just using pictures and, and bubble charts. So we, we kind of, we started moving into, uh, into this more um, quantitative side of, um, of, of bow ties. Uh, so the next few things that I'm going to say is probably, you know, is probably going to go just above most of the people that are listening to us. Uh, but this is important because at some stage, we as risk professionals, we need to move beyond pictures and actually provide valuable input into the decision-making of executives. Uh, so one of the things that we figured out quite quickly is, is that uh, you know, any compliance risk has a number of uh, consequence scenarios that we've already established, that's a given. Now, the, 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 the kind of the complex part is that even the legislation gives you the consequence scenarios as ranges and the ranges are uncertain. For example, it says, the regulator may halt the production for up to 90 days. That means that's a range between zero days and 90 days. And uh, the cost 
of that and the effect that would have on the business will obviously vary significant from you know having a one day hold which will cost you x million of dollars to 90 days which not only will cost you um, x million of dollars in lost production but it will also break down the whole supply chain and will affect your your overall uh, going to market strategy uh, so there's that but then when you start thinking about the kind of the reputational consequences and the general business consequences and the impact on society that is extremely uncertain so there are multiple uh, scenarios that may happen but the one kind of the one key takeaway was that every single consequence scenario is not a single number uh, it's not a single scenario it's a range of possible scenarios so that's when it became quite interesting because if you take the bow tie with the branches and you have ranges on each of the uh, each each of the consequence scenarios well how do you multiply ranges because you can't just yeah it's it's not like your uh, ISO or COSO risk management it's not three multiply two that you get six uh, it doesn't work like that you can't multiply ranges uh, just uh, arithmetically, you have to use something uh, a little bit more sophisticated to make it proper. How do you how do you kind of estimate the overall risk exposure? And uh, I'll ask people uh, to uh, to write in comments. Well, how do you multiply ranges? To tell us what's the what's the mathematical technique that uh, none of the compliance officers have ever heard of, but uh, most risk managers should have. And uh, apparently, well, not apparently. That's the kind of that's that's the easiest, most practical way to quantify compliance risks when we use bow ties with uh, different consequence scenarios. So please write in the comments: How do we multiply ranges um, using what technique? Have you come across any attempts to try and quantify um, the consequence scenario or, or, the, or the bow ties? And also, but do, do you like the ISO and COSO guidelines on compliance risks? So if I need to answer that, uh, Alex, I can't say I love COSO and ISO now because you've said they're terrible and uh, so on. Look, look honestly, the, the five by five matrix, as we all talk about, is, is trying to get one dot. Uh, when there's a whole probability distribution, exactly as you say. So it's very simplistic and at most it's an art form and we may as well stand in front of a, a, a canvas with a paintbrush and, and throw a dot at a, at a board. So there is a problem. Still people use it though. So certainly I'm not sure you say in Russia, no, but we still see it being used here. And I think that leads me to the issue we often find and that is that you know, quantification makes total sense. You know, it's obviously been said that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. I think that's a bit harsh. I think if you can't measure it, it makes it a lot harder to manage. So measurement makes total sense. The issue, I guess, for us, and I'd be interested in your, your comment here is, you know, as you go into more complex models for, when I say complex models, maybe not complex models for a good mathematician, but a complex model for, you know, someone who's not a mathematician, a general manager, a manager, a staff member, a board member, and you start then giving them numbers and then you have to explain to them in a way they'll understand kind of what you've done that's where we come up with a, a problem because if you can't explain they won't buy into it so how do you explain using um, uh, Bayesian which I'm sure you're going to talk about Bayesian that was Monte Carlo probability distribution decision trees how do you explain that to a person who needs to be responsible for risk but is not a mathematician or dare I say even an engineer that would be the the biggest challenge we find um, it, it's it's interesting. We kind of we briefly talked about this um, before starting the session today, and and I didn't disagree with you with you then because I thought it would be a valuable discussion uh, a, a discussion right now when we kind of when we have when we have, we have people um, communicating the outcome of proper risk quantification is the least of the problems I found, um, and uh, I, I hear this kind of this reason you know. Given in all different um, all, all different environments, uh, yeah, and kind of the most common argument I hear is that uh, it's it's difficult to communicate the results of uh, of quantitative risk analysis. I mean, I'll show you an example, and I'll, I'll attempt to prove that that's simply not the case. Um, the much bigger bigger problem 
is, is that uh, compliance officers or in fact HSC staff um, you know, in uh, I think in Australia it's still um, WHS or OHS. Um, yes. Uh, in, in, in Europe it's HSC because environmental kind of go 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 bundled into the um, into the package. So uh, most of our environmental officers, um, some some of them are actually you know pretty good at math, but most of them do not have the basic competency to perform even the simple calculations. And uh, um, you know, I, I keep saying risk management is not for shy people. So I haven't seen a single answer to the question that I asked in the comments, uh, but you've already given it. Uh, the way you multiply ranges is by using Monte Carlo, for example. There are multiple more complex ways, but that's like the easiest to do it. So without running a simulation, you basically cannot uh, estimate what's the uh, probability distribution of the risk exposure. And without that, you can't really tell how much you, how much money you should be spending on mitigating the risk and how much uh, uh, different mitigation strategies will reduce the risk exposure. Um, you know, getting to that initial probability distribution is highly important, and the easiest way to get there is by um, using a Monte Carlo simulation. So, uh, personally, I, I will answer your question. I just I kind of uh, I take a detour. I do not buy into the excuse, and I think it's just an excuse that uh, it's difficult to explain to executives uh, the probabilistic, you know, probabilistic distribution. It, it's not. It's much more difficult to get to, to get it, to calculate it, to perform the to perform the analysis, to have the result. Uh, because then you can you know, dissect the result in different ways, and I'll show you an example in a second. I'll screen share. Um, but the the real problem is basically you know, compliance officers have no idea and no training how to do it, which is actually, I mean, that's a given, that's fine. You don't become a compliance officer if you've got a degree in statistics or in math. Um, but there are risk managers in the team and uh, it, it's up to compliance officers to ask for help to quantify the risks, which is what our compliance officers do all the time and we help them with great pleasure. Uh, then the kind of the next round of trouble begins is, and I know Australia has, uh, ha has that trouble a lot, is when the risk managers themselves don't have the competency to do a basic Monte Carlo simulation. Um, and then it just, you know, it's just, unfortunately, that's just very sad um, that in 2021, we still have risk departments that don't have the necessary competencies to run a proper uh, real quantitative risk analysis. Because um, all of this stuff has been around for, for decades and we've been quantifying risks for, you know, 10, 15 years. Uh, and uh, the math hasn't really changed. The, we, we still use the same, you know, Monte Carlo was uh, developed in 1947 when they were creating the atom bomb. So, um, you know, we were still using prehistoric dinosaur mathematical methodologies to do it. So anyway, I'll share, I'll, I'll share a screen that just to show you. So this is, um, this is what a bow tie with uh, um, different distributions on the on the probability and the consequence ranges looks like normally, but then this is what you what you kind of what you see at the end. Uh, you can show the results as a histogram or an S curve. There are multiple ways of representing the information, but we found box plots, stochastic box plots, look uh, the easiest. And by the way. When we talk to executives, we use none of those words. Yeah, so I, I have I have an internal ban on using the word stochastic, <laughs> even though it's it should be the kind of second nature in risk management. But I have an internal ban within the company to use the word stochastic, um, which was funny because we were sitting with the head of investment and strategy yesterday, and he said we didn't follow your advice. We included. Uh, the word stochastic seven times in the latest board paper uh, and nobody challenged. So maybe may, maybe it's not that scary for executives any longer. But anyway, we, we try and speak in a normal normal business English language. Uh, and so what this basically shows is, I'll, I'll try and kind of blow it up a bit. Um, it basically shows you at the bottom, this is the you know millions of dollars in, in consequences. And on the left, there's the reasonable best case and on the right, there's the reasonable worst case. And what this basically means is that because there are different consequence scenarios and there are uh, different likelihoods for those scenarios to happen, the risk, if we're lucky, 
may cost us only uh, like half a million or, or less. But if we are very unlucky and uh, the regulator kind of prosecutes all the way, uh, then it could cost us up to, uh, I think, 160 is the number here, 160 million. And then, of course, there is some sort of expected uh, expected you know, median cost of risk. So we, we can show each risk as a possible range. And uh, depending, and, and then it kind of goes into different directions because depending on the uh, taste, and it's pretty much a matter of taste, depending on the taste of the executives, they can, sh they can kind of ask you to just show the uh, worst case scenario. For example, if we were to ever um, include it in the risk register, you know, God forbid, but if we ever had to, then we would uh, rank all risks based on the worst case scenarios, which is uh, what if anybody in uh, project management is listening to us, they would know it as P95, which basically means the 95th percentile of the distribution of risk exposure. Uh, so it's, it's basically saying 95% of the time, this risk would cost us less than this amount. And there is a 5% probability that it will be worse. Um, but that's the kind of, that's the common uh, metric used for communicating risk. So some people prefer to see the whole distribution between the best case and the worst case. Some people just like the kind of the reasonable uh, worst case, but then the, you know, communicating, communicating the risk by itself is a pretty, is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty kind of questionable value. Um, we, we don't manage risks for the sake of managing risks. You know, risk analysis is just a sub-step in decision-making. We, we try to understand risk exposure so that it allows us to make better business decisions. So knowing that a particular compliance risk costs 160 million 95% uh, of the time is a pretty useless information uh, because it's not about managing risk. And, and that's why our kind of next um, next metric is this, where we try and show how different mitigation strategies actually reduce the risk exposure. And, you know, in, in purple, doing something would, well, and there was a particular you know, set of actions that we were proposing or the, the environmental team was proposed to do, proposing to do, that would reduce exposure, uh, significantly reduce the worst case scenario, slightly reduce the kind of expected uh, consequence scenario. Uh, and clearly that wasn't enough because the risk exposure was still, uh, was still suffic uh, sufficiently large. It was still up to 100 million, which is um, a big amount of money. But then uh, there was uh, there, there were other uh, other mitigation strategies, and that's the kind of the bottom red. And those colors don't mean anything. It's you, know, you, uh, up, you forget about the normal green, yellow, red. Uh, that wasn't that was just random colors that the that the system uh, picked for communicating the messages. Uh, but it's actually the, the best mitigating strategy, the best set of mitigating strategies reduce the risk quite dramatically. And even visually, you can see that the risk reduction is huge from what it was initially in the yellow to what it will, uh, will be in the red. But then how we communicate it, and we've communicated this to all levels of executives uh, within the company, how we communicate is in words saying that this investment decision is, uh, is the most preferable one because it gives the best return for the reduction in risk, the best reduction in risk and the best return on, uh, or on investment. And uh, I didn't really kind of find it, I didn't really have any trouble communicating uh, uh, the output or the output of quantitative risk analysis to executives because first they, they quite well understand what the kind of what the worst case scenario is in uh, for for each risk. Um, that they really did not have trouble in understanding what the worst case scenario of the risk is. It's basically a combination of different branches of consequence, um, but you know, calculated mathematically correctly. And, and they also really appreciated the uh, the level of reduction and the estimates on how much money should be spent on on mitigating a particular risk. 
Um, so that, uh, I mean, ask questions in the comments and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I've probably scared our listeners so much because they've been really, really quiet for the last, uh, for the last 20 minutes. Uh, please ask questions and make comments uh, in, um, in, in the comments section. Um, but that's, that's how I found. I didn't really uh, find it difficult communicating. I mean, much more difficult was uh, building the initial model to actually quantify uh, the risks. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later because uh, we've, we found some you know, quite clever and funky ways uh, of doing it. Um, but what, what was your experience, David? Um, look, I, I think I think the way you've explained that is really good, and it was it was it was kind of getting me thinking that you know forgetting not forgetting but putting compliance risk or you know quantification of bow ties aside for a second. If we stand back and think generally, you know, quantification within risk management, you know, what we're actually finding, even at a more basic level, is that quantification can actually give us a guide. And so we do it and then based on what we see, you can then turn the answer into plain English. And I think you said that really, really well in the sense that maybe the quantification tool is about getting the right answer for decision making. And then a part of the risk manager's job is to be able to interpret that in plain English in a simple way that non-mathematical people will get. You know, and it, it brought me back, you know, when you were talking many years ago and I started my kind of risk management career in, in market risk in investment banks and you know uh, there where we've got lots of data and Monte Carlos were normal and probability distributions of value at risk and options pricing and all the rest of it was was there and I thought one of the things that we always used to do was a little thing called attribution analysis so what that was all about was getting up a number but then dissecting it so you could explain say the P&L in the day in really simple terms that anybody could understand. And I think the way you've explained that is is probably nailed it for me, that there's no reason why we can't do quantification, but we have to interpret and translate into something that makes sense in a business language. And we should be able to do that if we're good risk managers. So, um, you know, that's, that's good. It's got my brain cells going, Alex. So thank you. Thanks, David. Um, I, I totally agree. It's um, it, it, it's about interpreting the results, the outcome of the analysis, and how it changes um, how it changes or affects the decision. That was kind of that was the big takeaway for me when more than a decade ago we started quantifying our risks and um, trying to build that little bridge between the risk exposure and the actual business decision. That quite often. Uh, when we actually build a proper model and quantify the risks, the conclusions were different to the intuitive conclusions uh, that the, the management was was making or was about to sign off on. Uh, and that was that was quite interesting for me is that the conclusions from proper risk analysis usually significantly different from uh, um, what the management intuitively uh, thinks. Not in this case, but not in this particular case that we've done, because we've just uh, we've con we've pretty much confirmed the hypothesis that the management had, which, by the way, was amazing because they were so grateful. Uh, they they were you know, it was it was a tough decision to make, and they were a little bit intimidated and scared to take it to executives uh, to sign off on this investment. Um, and through our analysis, we showed that this was really in all different scenarios. We've basically you know, tested. 10,000 different scenarios and in, in all of those scenarios, it was still the best decision. So that kind of gave them the, the evidence and the support to say that uh, we've stress tested our, our decision and it looks like it still is the best possible decision given the circumstances. So they, 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 they appreciated and they found it quite helpful um, that we helped them do that analysis. But the other, the other funky thing that we do uh, right now, and uh, I wish kind of more risk teams would do that uh, is that once you build a bow tie for a particular type of risk and right now we've built the bow ties for water pollution air pollution and solid waste uh, but once you build those bow ties the only kind of thing from um, company to company or from plant to plant that changes are the chemical concentrations on, the, on pollution levels and uh, the cost of kind of you know, stopping the business. Uh, and uh, 
we we really what we're trying to do right now is we're turning those little bow tie models and in our excel models we literally have a bow tie like we, we put in the picture and then we build the model um the mathematical model around it uh, and that's why i love bow ties because they they're wonderful basis the kind of foundation for a mathematical model um but what we've done is once you build those mathematical models once you can reuse them instantaneously because no longer running a Monte Carlo simulation is a timely or a complex exercise. Uh, you used to need special software like model risk or at risk or crystal ball to run the simulations, uh, but you don't really anymore because you now have things like SIPMath, uh, which uh, allows me to create a Monte Carlo model in Excel. And then once I create the model, it becomes a native Excel file. And what this means is I can send this model, this calculator to anyone in the company and they can use, uh, plug in their own numbers and it will automatically re-simulate within milliseconds. Um, the, you know, it will apply Monte Carlo to give you the, the new proper distribution of risk exposure, um, but they don't need to use any special software. In, in fact, they can do it on their phone. Uh, because you know, there's Excel on the phone right now. So it just becomes a native Excel file. And this is this is kind of the next funky thing that we do. We're basically building those compliance and environmental calculators. Uh, and then we're just giving it back to the business and saying, well, the, the all the algorithms and the math is built in and you don't have to touch it. All you have to do is change your business values and change your business assumptions if they, you know, if they differ from one uh, factory to another factory and uh, the calculation will be done automatically which I, which I think is uh, is really help, is, is really cool and kind of a nice way to make proper risk quantification more accessible because what I'm finding is the biggest challenge is not the executives you know executives get it and they value it and they use it for decision making and it's 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 much easier for them to make a decision when you give them the distribution of in millions of dollars instead of you know, colorful bubble chart. Um, the, the real problem is that most uh, compliance teams don't have the kind of the skill to build the model in the first place. But if somebody else builds the model for them and hands it over and the model is, model is completely uh, autonomous and can be updated instantaneously when the, uh, you know, when the, when something changes, for example, uh, the one of our competitors receives a fine and we, we can add that to the data uh, in the model, and that will adjust the probability of a particular branch. Um, that, that, that I think is pretty cool, and maybe that's kind of that's the future of compliance risk because they're, they are relatively easy to quantify compared to um, so some of the other business risks. Uh, and uh, once you kind of build the templates, then updating them is also pretty, uh, pretty easy. So what, what are your thoughts on that, David? Yeah, I guess um, you know, one of the things I've been thinking is, you know, how how do the challenges change based on the type of risk and I guess the type of organization. So, you know, obviously there needs to be inputs and you know, where do we get the inputs for probability? You know, depending on how we build it, the probability of each node occurring and whether it's a conditional or unconditional relationship and all those things. Um, you know, where do we get that information from? And you know, going back again to kind of my my banking days, it was all about look, the more data we had the more robust the model would be and obviously in a lot of um, you know uh, um, operational risk type scenarios we do lack a lot of data so obviously we can look at historical incidents around a bow tie and start mapping you know how many times was the cause caused by this and what was the size of the impact and so on so I guess one of the challenges that I do see with this particularly in areas where we don't have a lot of data you know where do we get the information to to to, to model from um, so I think that's important. The other one is also where the compliance consequence is less defined as in legislation. And, and I guess, you know, certainly globally in Australia, we see, you know, AML CTF 
uh, particularly anti-money laundering and kind of terrorist financing, the, the size of fine is almost left up to the regulator. And if I was to go back, you know, back five or six years in Australia, the regulator, you know, was even um, noted by the World Bank as, as having little teeth. Uh, they weren't doing a lot of fines. And then, you know, they were highlighted, hey, you need to get sharper teeth, which is bigger fines. And it was like, how, what, you know, we've never seen this before. What's it going to be like? And really crystal ball gazing as to what that range could be. So I guess that's a big challenge. And I'm almost maybe asking yourself, Alex, uh, we should be taking questions from others, but you know, what do we? How do we cope with with lack of data, and where do we get the inputs to these models that make it robust enough that we can hang a you know hang hang our hat on it and say, hey, this is good enough for decision making. Uh, that, that's a great question, and uh, I'll, I'll answer it in a second. I see David asked a really good question as well. Um, uh, he's basically saying, I did a quantification, but the um, management didn't like the results, um, and. Um, uh, what would I do in those circumstances? 90% uh, of the time, and, and this is where we have to be really honest with, with ourselves, and this is why um, the risk team needs to be competent to do this kind of analysis, or at least somebody in the company needs to be competent to do that kind of analysis. Um, most of the time, 90% of the time, when we get the results that look outrageous or something is just not right, it's because we made a methodological error in our modeling. Um, and uh, you know, with bow ties, it's a pretty simple model. Like there's, there's very little uh, error you can build in. But when we do investment uh, decision analysis, uh, the models are super complex. For example, you know, it, it, it takes somewhere between uh, 20 and uh, an hour, 20 minutes and an hour to run a single you know, 5,000 iteration simulation. Uh, which is heavy because it would take for a compliance risk, it would take I don't know, maybe 10 seconds to calculate uh, the risk exposure. Uh, and complex models are prone to error. So if the management didn't like the answers, um, there's a very good chance is that because the answers are wrong. And we check, double check, triple check, and we sanity check all of our outputs of risk analysis with like head of investment and head of strategy and some finance guys and we always so you know the version that we show management is usually like version 37 i'm exaggerating a little bit but i just want to give you kind of an idea you know the first few simulations that we normally do in complex models are always wrong for some for some reason or other um so there's a very you know, answering your question the management didn't like the answers there's a very real probability that the answers were not right and the management intuitively thought and felt that it was not right and that's why they rejected it and we have to be very conscious of that we came back and rerun models and rechecked simulations many many times and uh, management if anything top level executives they're not stupid that they they, they they can sense when something doesn't look right so i would uh, i would be very glad when somebody told me that something doesn't look right because i can go back and check and uh, come back with the results. Um, and, but then, of course, the other 10% is that the calculations are right. Everything uh, checks out. We've made the right assumptions. We've pulled in the correct uh, data to support our assumptions, and the management just doesn't, doesn't like uh, the result. Well, that, that tells you something about the management. Um, is a, either there is some sort of corruption involved or... Um, there's some sort of other self-interest. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a big red flag. If you're absolutely certain the cal calculations are right and the management just violently rejects it, then it's a pretty good sign that something's not right in, in the company. And uh, uh, then every risk manager has really the choice. You know, push through, insist on his answers, which I, 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 I did. Um, in the previous company where I had this, uh, this instance where we did our calculations and uh, I keep telling that anecdote on, on most broadcasts that I do. We did the calculations and the probability of successfully uh, achieving strategic objectives was 0.0000003%. Um, it was just a polite way of saying basically the whole business plan was absolute bullshit. And... Um, we, we insisted on that and kind of uh, the management decided to double check the assumption and agreed to change the business plan eventually. Uh, but if they, if they don't, then you have a pretty, sim you know, pretty clear answer that uh, somebody is hiding something and then it's a choice for you whether you want to work with in, in that company 
uh, or not. Mm. So that was a, that was a long answer on uh, um, uh, on David's question. Uh, Corney is asking the system. Uh, it's called SIP Math, uh, S I P Math, uh, and it's a product by Stanford professor and his uh, associates. Uh, it's free, by the way, completely free. Uh, by it's created by probabilitymanagement.org. It's a non-for-profit that basically promotes uh, probabilistic thinking and proper risk analysis, uh, and they're amazing guys. Um, so that that was uh, that was a long answer to questions in the chat, and I see there's a question to Cla from Claudia. I'll come back to it a little, a little bit later, or maybe David, you want to take uh, Claudia's uh, uh, Claudia's question? I'll, I'll answer your your question now, David, um, on the data uh, because there is a very there's a wonderful analogy in Doug Hubbard's book, uh, The Failure of Risk Management, Why It's Broken and how, how to Fix It. And he calls it beat the bear fallacy. And the, the general idea there is that, and he gives like this anecdote, uh, two hikers uh, get ready to go into the woods and one of them is putting running shoes on. Uh, and the, the, the first one is saying, well, why are you putting the running shoes on? We're going hiking. And the second one goes, well, I heard that there are bears. And the first one goes, well, silly you, you can't outrun the bear. And the second one says, well, I don't need to run, outrun the bear, I just need to outrun you. And, and this is, uh, this is a bit the bear fallacy is the kind of the, the most quintessential idea in risk analysis. Uh, we're not trying to build a perfect know the future forecasting model. We're simply trying to build a model which is better than the decision-making model that was used yesterday. And that uh, is very important because uh, basically any, like literally any, even if I put numbers at random, uh, any stochastic bow tie uh, will give you, would get you closer, not close enough, but closer to the right decision than a heat map. Any bow tie on the planet. Uh, so, of course, and you're absolutely right, there's a lot of uncertainty in the ranges of the consequences because sometimes the regulator is vague, sometimes there's absolutely no regulation, and the fine is uh, basically, you know, there's the precedent, right, where you may have had some fines in the, in the, in the, in the past, and that's the only thing you have to go by, but that's not an indication of what the fines in the future will be because the regulators change their kind of strategy all the time. Uh, we had not our company, uh, thankfully, but one of our, uh, one of the large companies in the region had a huge environmental disaster. And surprise, surprise! Literally the next day, uh, the regulators changed their tune. They they doubled the uh, the man the, the the manpower of the regulator within months, and they started fining left, right, and center. They just went all out. So that clearly just threw out all of our statistics out of the window. Um, so, you know, long answer to your uh, to your uh, to your question because it's not an easy question. Uh, we do our best to collect as much data as possible, and there are you you would be surprised. That's another kind of big challenge because the compliance officers they don't really they rarely spend time to look for that information. It's all there. Uh, there are annual reports by the regulators that publish statistics on fines and um, uh, and uh, different damages paid. Uh, there are there there's court data, and there, there are a couple of different court systems in Russia where we could pull data from different sources. There are internal uh, uh, statistics on how many visits we had, how many fines we had, what were the consequences when such risks happened in the past. Uh, there are certain internal estimates, for example, you know, how much does one day of production cost at a particular plant? Well, most companies actually have done that estimation for financial purposes ages ago. So they have some sort of estimate on how much that would cost. And you can take those existing internal estimates and plug it into your models. And for everything else, if there was nothing, then you can use your internal and external experts to give you expert-based estimates uh, in, in ranges. So you can always find enough information to give you estimates. It, 
for some risks that never happened before, obviously your estimates will be, I'm trying to show it, will be a lot wider. For risks that are very common, your estimates will be much narrower because you have a pretty good historical data uh, on, on what that is. Um, but then the key to remember is any stochastic bow tie is better than none uh, and much better than any heat map. I mean, you can spend three months working on the heat map. I can spend 15 minutes on, on a stochastic bow tie and I would still be better off uh, in terms of decision making. So th that's kind of that, that's the that's the key to remember. We're not we're not forecasting the future. Our objective is to estimate the uncertainty. So we're not we're not um, trying to predict if, if the future what the, what this risk will actually cost. We have no idea. We can estimate what the kind of what the range of that cost for particular risk uh, is be uh, will be. And uh, once you start digging, you would be surprised just how much data there really is. I mean, when we started digging, we found all sorts of government uh, statistics that were useful to us. Yeah. I mean, it just reminded me when you were saying that, particularly the comparison of the heat map to to uh, using a bow tie in the manner that you say is, you know, many years ago, someone said to me, all models are wrong, just some are more useful than others. And I think anything that develops us in terms of going forward, we obviously appreciate that, you know, all models by their very definition are, are, are wrong, but they're a lot more useful than the one that came before. And I think that's the, that's the key for me in, in thinking anything to do with quantification. So you, you made the comment, Claudia has made the comment, uh, it would be great if you could share your knowledge by creating a standard of bow tie models, which we can then easily adapt to companies, maybe a new business model, question mark, instead of everyone doing the learning curve by themselves. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I think I know what Alex is going to say. Absolutely, that's that's a, a big part of, I know from, from uh, reading Alex uh, widely is what he's all about and I'm sure you can comment on that. I think the, the issue is going to be is that you know where do we go from here in terms of uh, education and uh, and I, I guess the, the, the key is you know what does a standard bow tie model look like? Um, certainly I know and Alex has shared his blog with you there's a lot of great stuff in there you know we, we as a firm are starting to play with with you know software around bow ties not so much quantification more the initial structure and the skeleton so it is developing, and uh, I think the more people are listening to um, you know, what Alex is talking about and the importance of bow ties, both from a, what I'm going to call a left brain perspective, which is really the art form, and use it for storytelling uh, and moving all the way to the right brain in terms of putting quantification around it. You know, for me, it's a fantastic tool. And, you know, people often say, what's the value of the bow tie? And I think it really is a, a left brain and a right brain tool, and uh, it can capture the hearts and minds of the artists, but it can also capture to the hearts and minds of the mathematicians. So any comments on that, uh, uh, Claudia's comment, um, Alex? Yeah, I, I, told, I, I absolutely agree. And uh, in fact, I just uh, shared a link on the screen. Um, the Risk Awareness Week is um, uh, the biggest online risk event uh, that, uh, that, that I run every year. And last year we had 4,600 or 700 people participating. Um, and this year in October, I expect probably more, more, even more people will join. Uh, but we had a number of workshops with Sam Savage, who is a uh, Stanford professor and uh, kind of the, the creator of probabilitymanagement.org during the workshop. And he, he talked about crowdsourcing models. Uh, basically, that's the future. When uh, somebody creates a model and it becomes, uh, it gets verified by independent people and then it just becomes a public open source where anyone can download it, adapt to their business and, uh, um, and use it. So uh, what you, can, you can register for free at Risk Awareness Week still uh, because all of the workshops are still available online. And uh, you watch, watch the first session by Sam Savage and Bridget uh, Cash, I think, uh, who talk about crowdsourcing models because that's essentially exactly what Claudia is, is asking. I mean, this is... This is kind of the future where we're getting. There's crowdsourcing distributions, which is also you know, which is also amazing. For example, you know, we don't all need to uh, quantify COVID, or we don't all need to quantify foreign exchange. You know, certain things are equally applicable to any company uh, on the planet, and we can we can kind of, we can share a lot more in terms of quantitative risk analysis. And I think this is where we uh, we slowly go into. So yes, I totally agree. And uh, by the way, uh, Risk Academy blog 
I'm going to put it in chat, but I'm not sure if uh, who, who will see. Uh, the LinkedIn may not be able to see uh, the comment that I made. Uh, but the risk academy, just, you know, just Google risk academy. It's, it's one of the biggest blogs on risk uh, on the planet. And uh, uh, on the home page, there's an article which I called ISO and COSO haven't got a clue. Um, uh, compliance risks can and should be quantified. And I basically talk through the methodology. So you can, you can pretty much just copy the methodology and try and apply it at your company. So I'm a big fan of sharing and making you know, stuff publicly available. So I'm not, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the risk calculators that we do now will eventually be publicly available as well. And I encourage everybody to share their ideas. I mean, the only kind of the only thing that I'm highly disappointed about is that both ISO and COSO could have became become the platform for you know, sharing proper and promoting proper quantitative uh, bow ties, but they didn't. They they just they just went along with the flawed and absolutely moronic approach of uh, drawing uh, uh, compliance heat maps and pretended and tried to um, tr try to convince everybody that this was the best practice. I mean, it never was. It never uh, was the best practice in any kind of risk analysis. Um, but it's very unfortunate they that they went ahead and published the two documents that they did. The, the second disappointing thing is the software vendors that uh, do bow ties. Uh, I, I did use one of the kind of the, the most popular bow tie software uh, on the planet, and uh, it, it was wonderful for building pictures. But it didn't even kind of they didn't even the, the creators didn't even think about the functionality of expanding it into quantitative risk analysis. And the only, um, the, the only company that attempted to do that and uh, did that quite successfully was uh, Voices Software that uh, had the pro product called uh, Pelican, which is basically like a stochastic uh, bow tie diagram. Um, I, I just wish all the kind of other uh, others, other bow tie software companies was kind of at least made an attempt to move towards quantification and not just a pretty picture. Um, so, you know, hopefully one, one day. Mm. Any other thoughts, comments, David? And by the way, any other comments, uh, please write in the, in the chat. Yeah, look, the, the only other thought I had here was, um, you know, th there is the risk manager that helps people make decisions. And then I guess the, particularly in financial services, there is the risk manager, you know, we, we, we often call the line two manager, well, I won't get into that debate, but the line two manager that is there to review and challenge. And, I, and I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here that, you know, if decisions are being made by the business and the line two risk manager is able to take a model like this, run numbers, and it comes up with a, a different answer to the decisions that are being made, it's kind of a wonderful tool to commence challenging and go into the business and, and challenge them on the principle that the decision that they are making is kind of not in sync with the numbers that are coming out. And, you know, going back to that point about dissecting, you know, what the number means and comparing it to the decision making process that may be not so robust in the business, and it would be a great ch um, place to start challenging. And I reason I say that, I think that a, a lot of line to risk people have a bit of an identity kind of crisis going forward is to what exactly is their role and as they move to more a challenge function rather than actually being you know the frontline business risk managers what are they going to challenge with is it just a nice kind of hard chat over a cup of coffee or will they have some basis a robust basis to create that challenge and maybe that move to quantitative in an organization where the front line isn't maybe so sophisticated but risk management got those skills, it may be a way of A, challenging and B, introducing a more quantitative approach into the business. So that, that may be something to think about, particularly for financial services where those three lines of defense model, dare I say, is still trying to, trying to survive. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, interesting thought. Um, I, I probably need, need to think about it a little bit more. Mm. I, I'm, I'm not sure we can, we're up to challenging stage yet. I, I more see um, the risk team 
as the kind of uh, you know, quantitative risk analysis, internal outsourcing team that um, you know, every department wants to make decisions and decisions under uncertainty require specific techniques to, to help make those decisions. And quantifying uncertainty and quantifying the effect of uncertainty on decisions um, should be happening for most important decisions. But then or, or most of the teams, the strategy department, the finance team, the investment team, the legal team, the compliance team, the health and safety team, none of them really have the competencies except maybe the investment team because you know, they, they, have, they, they certainly have the, the, the training to do it, but they, they've, never really, they've never really done it in the past because nobody asked them to. Um, and instead of everyone, instead of you know, every compliance officer, every legal um, uh, employee, uh, uh, every HSC uh, officer, instead of them having the skills to do it, maybe they can just all outsource to the internal risk team. And the risk team kind of is the team that does all the calculations in the first place. So it kind of always becomes the first line in, in your terminology. Um, so uh, I'm not, I'm, you know, I haven't really given it much thought, but at the moment, I know where I am today. I'm basically, everyone within the company outsources complex uh, quantitative uh, um, risk analysis and uncertainty analysis uh, to us and, uh, and we do it to support their decision-making and kind of incorporate it back into their decisions and present their decisions uh, with the risk analysis uh, attached. So maybe at this stage, we're kind of, that's where, that's where we are. Mm. Uh, no, I guess the only other thought, Alex, was, you know, if we do this bow tie by bow tie, uh, which is obviously, you know, at a more granular level, risk by risk, you know, obviously at the higher level, uh, uh, you know, three or four small bow ties can become a bigger one. And uh, that bigger one can then gets correlated with another one. And uh, I often, you know, in my crazy times, think there's one bow tie for a whole organization. Uh, uh, it would be a fairly large and complex one. And I guess, you know, is there a potential to be taking these measurements to give a, excuse me, a, a business unit view, a value chain view, a geographic view where you are taking multiple bow ties? with quantification to come up with a risk for that area. Why would you bother doing that? It, it may be to do with the allocation of capital. It may be charging for the risk and uncertainty they are using. Risk-based performance, I don't know. Do you see that's where this could head? Yeah, that, that, is, that, that is actually, uh, and uh, I'm guessing the people kind of watching us right now probably didn't uh, didn't feel the, the significance of this question. This is a much deeper question than it seems. Um, because, and this kind of you know, opens up a lot of important messages. And I think one of the important, one of the most important messages is, is that there are different techniques for different situations. And uh, that's why we have, you know, bow ties, uh, scenarios, stress tests, uh, decision trees, um, factor-based analysis, and, and few other quantitative techniques. All of them allow to quantify risks. But to kind of to give you a simple answer to your question is I definitely think we should never do that. Um, and uh, the bow ties are wonderful for understanding the nature of a particular risk when we have a limited number of risks that we need to think about or when we have the risk which deserves its own attention. Because um, calculating you know, risk adjusted performance or uh, capital allocations or risk limits or charges for the risks that would be appropriate for a particular unit or quantifying the effect risk has a cash flow or on a cash flow or PL of a particular business unit or the company overall or calculating or quantifying the way uh, risk, risk has an effect on the liquidity of the company overall or the probability of achieving objectives. Uh, there are much, much better techniques for doing that. And uh, I would, uh, you know, it, or, or you could, technically speaking, you could build this monstrous uh, multi-level bow ties, but that would be ridiculous because there are at, at least a dozen easier ways of getting to the same answer and probably in a better way uh, as well. So that, that's why 
I keep, you know, when I was kind of fighting the, the war in, in the ISO 31000, I was very much against the, 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 the notion that there is some sort of risk management process. Uh, there are dozens of different risk management processes for different purposes. You know, we, in, in, in our company, we have like 10 different risk managements. For credit decisions, we use one type of risk management. For market risk decisions, we use different type of risk management. For investment decisions, we use a third type of risk management. For compliance risks, we use a fourth type. Of, you know, for procurement, we use a fifth. There, there are so many different, you know, different ways to apply uh, risk analysis to different processes and decisions, then it would be pretty silly to take one, which is kind of designed for this simplistic you know, compliance risk assessments, and take it to something something bigger and more and more complex. So I, I hope we don't get to that uh, because there are much 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 better ways to quantify risks at the company level or at the business unit level. Mm. So it's really a fit, fit for purpose use and totally understand. And um, I, I'm sorry I'm asking you questions, Alex, but this is a great opportunity. So hopefully helpful to others. But I guess my thought is, you know, standing back to the different type of industries, because um, from our perspective, we have a whole wide range of clients. And, you know, even without talking about quantification, you know, if we go out to an engineering organization where many engineers are there, talking quantitative and all these techniques is relatively easy. If we go into other industries uh, with maybe people from other backgrounds, it's a lot more difficult. And I just wonder, you know, how, how, who, who are the best at accepting all of this? And, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we educate the others to, to move down this pathway as quick as possible? Um, it, it, the, 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 I think the, the simple answer is I don't necessarily think it's as big of a problem as we we think it may be um, because the, the, you know, any kind of risk analysis uh, consists of getting the data, the analysis, and then the kind of the uh, 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 interpretation of the results. So it's almost like a bow tie, you know, the data in, then there's the core, the mathematical core and, and the output. The, the only difficult thing is the mathematical core and uh, most industries on the planet and most companies on the planet don't have everyone understanding that, which is fine. I mean, it's just the same as not everyone in the company is a, is a tax expert. That's why you have a tax department that is responsible for optimizing the tax strategy and supporting the business units in terms of tax implications. Well, in, in my mind, just in a similar fashion, we have the risk department that becomes the kind of this in-house outsourcing agency for all kinds of quantitative analysis. And uh, once you have someone in place who knows how to kind of convert information into a model and run the, run the calculation, run the simulation, then the conversation becomes much easier. Because when we speak to our, for example, compliance officers and when we speak to our environmental team, uh, for some that enjoy it, we do have like a proper mathematical discussion. But most of the time we don't speak mathematics. We just say we need uh, for this particular branch of consequences, we need to understand how the fines are calculated. You know, what's the formula for calculating the fines? And they go, well, okay, the formula is provided in this and this regulation. So we, we pull the regulation and we say, well, to support the formula, we need to put in the concentrations of different, different chemical elements. They go, well, that's easy. We have all those concentrations collected in a separate place because every kind of uh, you know, probe that we take of the air or the water for pollution, we, we record all those chemicals and they're stored in a different place. And we go, well, give us the numbers and we'll just plug them in. And then we, go, we, we talk about, well, we would also like to see kind of the frequency. How often do companies get fined? And they say, well, we can do that by checking the court statistics in a particular region. And the court statistics we can find on the sides of the local court. And they go, well, okay, well, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty easy. So what I'm trying to say is that once you have somebody to take care of the technical mathematical side, the rest of the conversation is very business. It's, it's, very, it's very plain English, very simple to understand. It's, it's, very, it's very down to earth. It's, we're saying, have this ever happened before? 
Um, let's look at our, you know, our history with the regulators, you know, what kind of fines we have. Or let, let's look at our industry. What can we get from our competitors? Can we look at their financial reports? Can we look at their annual reports? Can we look at regulator sites? Uh, every kind of conversation we had, uh, they, you know, it may be a little, a little bit intimidating up front because, you know, people are not used to collecting these external statistics, uh, but they very clearly understand where to get it. And uh, uh, and then they just kind of, you know, they just find it and they give it to us, they find it and they give it to us. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's a kind of, uh, they, there's, there's much less, what I'm trying to say is that there's much less educating that needs to happen uh, than it may seem. And uh, this is what I'm, I, I keep trying to, uh, to convey is that using this uh, quantitative risk analysis is not that much effort. It's not, it's not a complex task. It's not, it's not complicated. It's you, once you have someone who can build the model and that's, you know, your, I don't know, your third year degree uh, student in statistics who can do that. Once you have somebody who can take care of the math, math the rest of the conversation is very business driven and very simple kind of intuitive to, to understand. Um, and we were able to have those conversations almost immediately. I, I mean, I was, I was once kind of in a situation where we had a call and I thought we would just have the call with the internal auditors and we, because we were building like this model for, for them to help them prioritize the audit areas uh, for environmental risks. Uh, and I thought it was just kind of an internal discussion, but then I didn't realize, but the actual executives, a couple of executives joined from our transportation company and uh, within five minutes of just talking very simple, plain English, they immediately kind of understood what we were trying to do. And it was, you know, it was, it was very straightforward because we didn't need to explain, you know, why do we use log normal uh, instead of Poisson distribution? You know, that's the kind of, that's the boring talk that we leave for ourselves. You know, do we use Perth distribution or triangular distribution? No one cares. Um, we, we will obviously backtest it and we will figure out what's the best one to use, uh, but no one cares within the business and the, the kind of the conversation that we have the, 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 you know, the client, the internal client facing is, is much, is much, much, much uh, more plain English than, than the kind of the, the mathematical insight. Yeah. And I guess with, you know, everything you're, you're saying, Alex, is it's, and I know you're a big supporter of this, but risk management becomes the decision support unit uh, and, and in the way you described it is, is I guess it's exactly that is the decision makers are using risk management in your description of it as the support unit to give them the quantification of uncertainty so they can factor it into their decision making unit which also a decision making which in many ways is is not the way risk managers see themselves at the moment and uh, you know that I guess that's the value add because you know I often say in in in, in risk management so what you know, we, we do produce lots of color pie charts and the wonderful matrix and so on, but so what? And, and I guess as you are so passionate about decision making, um, this, this whole process is pushing the risk manager towards that decision making uh, unit. Would that be a fair representation of your view, Alex? It, to, to, totally. And I, I, and I wish that more risk professionals started seeing themselves as uh, decision support to the uh, to the business, as opposed to some sort of this kind of artificial role of identifying, assessing, and mitigating risks, you know, for the sake of mitigating risks. Um, you know, risk mitigation is not the ultimate goal, and risk analysis is not the ultimate goal. It's just it's just a a technique, a a, a way to get to a better more informed uh, more informed decisions so i wish more risk managers started seeing themselves uh, as that uh, because we've we've had all the tools i mean bow ties when, 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 when did you say 70s 79 apparently it's uh, so, so so dr google says or uh, <laughs> wikipedia yeah. says so apparently alex 79 and, and, yeah. you know, the, the the mathematical side of it is uh, the 1940s and uh, the um the, the theory, um, so, some of the mathematical theories that we use and that are very important on why, for example, we shouldn't use you know, average single point estimates in any kind of risk analysis and why it's pretty much ridiculous 
to have risk with a single score on consequence and a single score on likelihood. Um, that, that theory uh, was called Jensen's inequality and it was proven in, I think, 1904, 1906. So it's uh, 120, almost 120 years old. And uh, somehow we've just kind of missed, <laughs> we've missed the message and we're still doing something that just goes beyond the most basic you know, probability theory, um, which is, yeah, which is unfortunate. Yeah. So thank you, David, very much. Uh, Adrian made uh, made the comment. I can see it. I don't completely understand it, but I guess uh, what he's proposing is uh, could be a good way to combine bow ties uh, and uh, uh, make it more kind of manageable. But then again, I would say that if we were to uh, try and kind of estimate the effect of uncertainty on business objectives within a particular company or a business unit, I probably wouldn't use bow ties in the first place. I would use something completely different. I'd use key assumptions check and uh, Monte Carlo again. Uh, so, so there are kind of there are better there are better techniques for different situations. We don't have to stick to just one favorite and uh, and use it all the time. Um, so I know we, we're a little bit over time. David, thank you so much for, for your time. Very much appreciated. Thank you to everyone watching us. Um, write comments. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see it after we disconnect. And you can always reach out to David at uh, Protect and uh, myself on LinkedIn. Thank you and see you soon. Great. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everyone.